we'll get started. Um, so, welcome, uh, Kubernetes networking in approximately 20 minutes. I've updated the, the title. Um, I will try and fit it in the next 20 minutes. We might run a few minutes over. I will uh, also start the clock and we'll see how close we can get. All um, questions into the Teams room. I've got a lot of content to cover. Happy to answer any questions through the team space uh, or afterwards. So I'm here for the rest of the week. I can stay as long as you want today. And I'm over somewhere there in the ACI walk-in clinics as well if you've got questions on that. So we've got 20 minutes to cover a huge amount of content. There is a really good presentation tomorrow sometime. Uh, it's a breakout session, Container Networking Deep Dive. It's got, I think, 450 people registered, so hopefully you guys are all one of those. Um, Ivan, the presenter, will be going through a lot more content that I can possibly cover today with a lot more slides. I have a lot of hidden slides as well, so if you want to join the WebEx room, I'll share the PDF and, and the presentations afterwards as well. There are also a couple of sessions on Istio. There's a couple on Cisco Container Platform. Um, we've got World of Solutions opening probably now. So if you want to go and have a look at Container Platform, do that as well. So let's get stuck into it. So here is the, here is the application that I have uh, spun up in, in the lab. This is a guestbook application. So it's a, a famous or you know, a popular um, Kubernetes application that, that's available. So you type a message, you press submit, and then it's, it's stored somewhere. The way that it works, we have two components. We have a front end, so it's a web server, PHP, Apache. We also have a back-end database. So in this case, it's a Redis database. And so this is where we store all of our messages. So let's see how this, this actually works and, and how it goes together. Apologies, I didn't realize it would be such a small screen. I thought I would get quite a large one. So hopefully, it's easy enough to read. So we have a couple of front-end pods, a couple of back-end pods. Um, we have two worker nodes, so you could have multiple worker nodes. Two fits nicely on the screen. We have master nodes somewhere there as well. Each worker node in Kubernetes will get its own subnet, so 192.168.1.0 and 2.0. And the first thing with Kubernetes is that every pod in Kubernetes gets its own IP address from this subnet. So front end pod 192.168.1.24. Front end pod 2, 192.168.2.15. All right, so every pod gets its own IP address. All containers within a Kubernetes pod will share that, that namespace, that networking namespace, will share that IP address and will be able to communicate on local host along with the, the port that they're, they're listening and, and um, that they've exposed, right? So there's a, some kind of virtual ethernet interface, a VETH pair. So that connects from our pod to something else. Um, in our case, it's going to be to a, a tunnel interface. And a tunnel interface, we will see that because it's uh, a plug-in model for pod-to-pod -pod communication. Right? This tunnel zero interface, in some instances, might be a bridged interface, depending on the plug-in that you're using. And then what we have is an Ethernet zero, or in our lab, it's an ENS192. This has an externally routable address in my lab. So I can't hit from, if I VPN into my lap from my laptop, I can't hit the 192.168, but I could get to 10.30.1.131 and 132, right? So each of my worker nodes and my master nodes has an externally routable IP address. So a couple of things that we're, or four things we're going to cover. Container to container, pod to pod, how we keep track and access pods externally, and how we do some additional routing, so reverse proxying, HTTPS routing. First one we've already covered, every container uh, or multiple containers within a pod all share the same network namespace and communicate on the local host interface. So that's how that works. Next one is how do we get from pod to pod um, communications? How do we get from front end pod one to back end pod one? And then how do we do that across worker nodes if we had that? Now, Kubernetes implements a plugin model. So it's called the CNI of plugin. And this is basically a third party you know, outsourcing application um, yeah, plugin that, uh, that is responsible for setting up the networking. And Kubernetes 
um, although it, it uses this plug-in model, it mandates that there are requirements that they need to follow, um, primarily NAT. So there is no NAT with pod-to-pod -pod networking. We will see NAT later on when we look at services, but for pod-to-pod -pod, um, using a, a plug-in, we, do we don't have NAT. So how do we get from you know, pod one to pod one or pod one to pod two across different worker nodes? That's what we're going to solve now. So CNI plugin, Kubernetes is calling upon some third-party um, application, CNI, that implements all of the networking and is responsible for all the networking for connectivity between pods. So that includes the virtual ethernets, it includes the, the tunneling or the bridging, um, it includes the routing uh, and, and things like that. So that is called the, the CNI plugin. Kubernetes or CNI and, and Kubernetes work together, but you could have other non-Kubernetes orchestrators also using a CNI plugin as well. Here's a list of some of them. The one that we're going to look at today, essence of time, is um, Calico, which is using a tunneling um, a method of tunneling and encapsulation to be able to solve this problem. Flannel is another popular one using VXLAN. You'll see down here we also have a Cisco ACI. CNI plugin, so you can write your own if you want to, as long as they conform to the requirements that we've already seen. Some of them, well, they all you know, do networking. Some of them have networking policies or more detailed networking policies. Some of them also have like security policies and things like that. So there is no right or wrong as to you know, which one is the best. It's going to depend on, on what your requirements are. So we're going to have a look at Calico. Um, I've got a ton of hidden slides. I just I couldn't fit them all in. Um, but the way that Calico works to enable pod-to-pod -pod communication is when we look at the pods on each of the worker and the master nodes, we can see that we have a Calico node pod that is running on every, every node. Calico implements or, or has two main components, one of which Im, um, configures IP tables, makes sure that we're res responding to ARPs, um, configures the routing table, configures the virtual ethernet, um, interfaces, and the second part is a BGP client, which ensures that we have uh, route distribution across all of our different master and worker nodes to make sure that when I need to go from one pod to another, I can do a lookup and that route to that pod on a different worker node is going to be made available. So those are the two main things, or the two components, main components of Calico. So we'll just verify what we can see with Calico. So when we, when we look at worker one and we look at the interfaces, we can see that we have um, ENS192, right, external um, interface. We have a tunnel zero interface. Again, this is because Calico uses tunneling. In our setup, you might have a bridged interface depending on, on the plugin that you're using. You'll also see here that we have a couple of uh, Kali 75 something and Kali uh, F70. These are our virtual Ethernet interfaces. So these are the ones that connect locally to, to our pods running on that worker node. And if we want to see what routes um, Calico has installed for us, you can see here in the interfaces we have our ENS192. And we also have our Calico virtual Ethernet interfaces, which points to our local um, front end pod and back end pods. And then we have our tunnel zero interface. So what, what this means is that if I'm on worker one and I need to get to 192.168.1.23, I'm going to send it to the virtual ethernet interface for that pod. And if I need to get to from pod one on worker one to pod two on worker two, that'll have a, a subnet of 192.168.2.0, and that's going to be sent through the tunnel zero interface, right? So it's pretty straightforward. So coming back to this question, how do we get from front end pod one to back end pod one, and how do we get from pod one to pod two? Right, we already solved that, and we do it without NAT, and we don't we, we don't know about these um, externally in our lab. We we use tunneling, right? So again, this is because Calico, the way that it's been set up in our case, is IP IP um, encapsulation, and we can confirm this by um, using TCP dump on this interface up here, so ENS192. And we are filtering on um, encapsulation, so tunneling protocol. And you can see here when I go from, uh, it's a little bit hard to read, 192.168.1.24, which is front end pod two, oh sorry, front end pod one to front end pod two. We have our source destination of our 192.168 addresses 
in, um, encapsulated in an externally routable 10.30 dot one address, right? So I, I send it to the tunnel, it gets encapsulated, I send it out of the worker, it's routable within my lab, it finds its way back over to worker two, comes back in, decapsulates it, sends it off to the virtual ethernet interface, and then it hits front end pod two, right? That's how pod to pod networking works using Calico in Kubernetes. So that's topic two. Topic three, and I have no idea how we're doing on time, but we're just gonna keep pushing through. Um, I can't hit from, if, I, if I'm on my laptop and I'm VPN'd in, I can't get to a 192.168 address, right? Because that's internal to a worker node only. So firstly, how do I get external access to these front end pods? And secondly, even if I was to get to one of these front end pods, these 192 addresses, I've got three of them. So which one do I choose? And, and if I had a hundred of them, how do I keep track of all the pods that have been spun up and spun down? in my environment. So this is, the, this is achieved in Kubernetes using a Kubernetes service, right? And that is a native um, implementation that Kubernetes has um, implements natively. Sorry, repeating myself. Um, so here's, a, here's an example of our guestbook application. The way that a lot of things are done within Kubernetes is through labels and selectors. So when we define something, we define uh, a, a new deployment with our front end pod. We can label it to say that I have an app guestbook and I have a tier, which is my front end web service. And I can create a service. So there's really three things that we want to look at with services. I can create a service that will select all of the pods that have this label in it and will keep track of all of my internal endpoint addresses for those pods. So I no longer have to keep or, or understand and, and remember which 192.168 IP address is assigned to which pod, right? Because a, a service will do that and it will be based on a selector. The second thing is that if I have front end pod, so in my application, front end pod talks to a back end pod because it has to get some data for my messages, right? How do I know from my front end pod, how do I know which of my backend pods I should speak to, or how do I know what the IP addresses of those backend pods are, um, that is also performed through a service, right? So we use the, the, same, or the, the same principle of we select our, our, our front end and we select our backend pod. And when I am in, in the code of my front end pod, I can simply reference or, or talk to the service of the backend pods, right? The service, when we implement a service in Kubernetes, we will automatically, for every service, be assigned a cluster IP. This is a, an internal cluster IP address. It is, it, it's not routable um, outside of, it's, it's not in the same you know, 10 range that we saw the externally routable in, in my lab environment. This is internal to the cluster only. Secondly, Kubernetes will also um, create a DNS record pointing to the backend.default.service.cluster.local. So now in my front end, I can simply um, resolve to that or, or, or use this DNS record and that will resolve my cluster IP and that will somehow get to 192.168.1 or .2, right? The way that this, this is implemented is um, by default in, in our environment through IP tables and through NAT rules, right? So it will, it will NAT from your external ad address into your internal address, right? And that's the third piece. So how do we get from my laptop, which is, has no access to, to this internal front end pod, um, that, is, that is done through a service using an external IP address, right? And we have two ways to do that. So here we've already covered. So every service, so cluster IP, um, every service gets a cluster IP and also gets a DNS record. Um, we define a service the same way we define anything within Kubernetes. So kind is a service, the type is a cluster IP, and we have a selector uh, of guestbook and front end, so oh, sorry, back end in this case. This service only applies to the back end pods or the, the, the pods that have the label back end. Um, the two ways that we might get external access, so from my laptop, for example, I, I put this address in the browser and it gets my, my guestbook example. I have a service type node port, so this is basically in my browser, I put in the IP address of any of the worker nodes, and then I put in a, another port, the node port, 
and I just do port forwarding. So Kubernetes will implement this, this rule so that it will forward anything received on any of the worker nodes, in this case 10.30.1.131, my externally routable address, and on port 32222, it will then forward that onto one of the pods that are available that has been selected by my selector, right? The third type, which is one of the most common ones, is a load balancer, right? So service is the kind of a service, the type is a load balancer. It is selecting to load balance my traffic to one of the front end pods. Now Kubernetes doesn't implement the load balancing service um, natively, it, it relies on a load balancer. So for example, um, the lab that we've got set up using Cisco Container Platform has by default Metal LB, which is an open source load balancer that you can use. Um, Kubernetes will work in conjunction with Metal LB to ensure that the addresses, the, the pool of virtual IP addresses are available so that every time I create a service with the type load balancer, it will pull an IP address from that that pool of available addresses. It will then create the rules so that when I put this address, again, this is not the same as the, um, the worker node addresses, but this is routable in my, my lab. When I go to this in my browser, Metal LB will then respond to that request and will forward it on to one of my front end pods, right? This is very popular. We use Metal LB on premises. If this was in a public cloud, you could use one of the public cloud load balancers as well. Um, you, have to, you have to think about scale in this sense because we have a number of external IP addresses that we need to be available. You might have be limited in the, the external ranges that you have. They might cost money if you're using cloud services and things like that. So we might use a different method um, in order to scale. But these are the three ways that we can, we can uh, implement services. So here's a screenshot. I've got many hidden slides, um, other similar screenshots. This is just to show that Kubernetes will natively um, implement the IP tables rules for us so that we can, um, uh, so that we have the, the NAT configuration from port, in this case, uh, service type node port 32222, gets translated or directed to our 192.168.1 or .2 backend, right? So that's how that works behind the scenes. But we simply have to, we don't have to do any of that. We don't, we don't even know how, or, or have to know that it exists. We just have to create the service and let Kubernetes take care of that for us. So the last part, and I think I'm a little bit slow with my, my talking, so I'll progress a little bit quicker so you guys can get to your next sessions, um, is the ingress, right? So if we want to, so what we just saw with services is more like L3, L4. If we wanted to do some um, rule-based routing, so HTTPS or HTTP um, routing, or we wanted to do some SSL, TLS, something like that, or we wanted to funnel everything through a central ingress, Kubernetes ingress or reverse proxy is the way that we do that. And an ingress, so a, a service um, mapped to, to different pods, an ingress maps to service. So it's not one or the other, do I use a service and, and, or do I use an ingress and forget about services? If we have ingresses, we have services. If we don't need ingresses, we can just use services, right? So this provides us with a little bit, um, uh, a little bit different routing, right? So I can specify a host, uh, so cisco live.cisco.com, and I can specify a path, so slash guestbook or slash sock shop, um, yeah, slash sock shop. So depending on what application I want to hit, I put this in my browser, and the path then maps to a, a, a service. So in this case, guestbook maps to front end. So any traffic received on this path, I will send it to the front end service. And that service will then send it on to my um, front end pods, right? Um, this is just a, an example um, that we can do. There's different ways that we can write these files. This is what it looks like if we draw it out. Just like a service relied upon an existing um, load balancer, uh, yeah, so load, uh, service load balancer requires a load balancer like Metal LB, an ingress in Kubernetes requires an ingress controller. So it doesn't do reverse proxy for you. It will work in conjunction with something like Nginx for reverse proxy functionality, right? And it does the way that it gets the config uh, 
from our ingress, so our description of our ingress into Nginx itself is through a config map, right? So our traffic will come in and hit the ingress controller, so it will hit Nginx. Nginx will then have um, the configuration necessary to forward it on to our different services. So, and, and then from our services, we can then forward it onto one of our, our pods, right? So this allows us, one, to scale, because we don't have to have, um, so we can see we've got type cluster IP, because it's internal. This service is not externally reachable. All external traffic goes through the ingress. So it allows us to scale. Um, it, it allows us, to, if, if you know, external um, IP addresses cost money, it allows us to save some cost there. Um, and it also allows us to funnel everything through a single point. So instead, we could have hundreds of applications and different services, and we could define our rules and our forwarding and our policies based on our, our ingress, right? So those are the, the reasons you might use ingresses. And the final piece is just, just to confirm that it works, because we saw that everything else works, right? Um, so here's the same thing again. We can see here that we've got an Nginx comp. Um, so if you're using Nginx, Nginx will be monitoring Kubernetes. We've got a config map, and when any, anything changes, it will update our Nginx configuration so that when we receive traffic, we then have our ingress name and our services. I realize this um, is a bit old, this uh, configuration, but it will direct us off to the service and the port that it needs to go to, right? So all of this is done behind the scenes for you. You rely on an, a, an ingress um, controller, but you simply have to des uh, describe the ingress, and, and Kubernetes and the ingress controller will work together to do that for you. So ingresses, you could, you could use you know, cloud ingresses, you could use Nginx. Um, you can also annotate, so if it allows for annotations. Nginx, for example, has different annotations. So if I put in uh, rewrites, I can, I can put in a rewrite here, or, or I can configure Nginx through my um, YAML file, through my, um, my ingress description, through annotations. So those are the four things that we covered. We are at 22 minutes. Um, so it's approximately 20 minutes. So container to containers, local host, pod to pod is CNI. We, we looked at Calico today. We've got ACI, we've got Flannel, we've got Contiv, for example. Accessing pods is natively done through um, services, right? Keeping track of pods and external to internal communication. And for scaling, for routing, for, for TLS or anything like that, that is done through the ingress. Everything that you saw today, I built with Cisco Container Platform, which is a turnkey solution to, to build tenant clusters. Um, and it, it does all the integration. So the Metal LB, the Nginx, um, ACI, all of that will be configured by CCP for you. Um, so over in the WAS, they, they have uh, demos. They also have some uh, breakout sessions. And I think they've got a learning lab as well. Or if you've got questions, come and see me after. Again, these are some, um, some sessions that you should go to because they've got more information. I've got a bunch of references. Uh, Join, the, join the, the WebEx team's room, and I will share the slides right now in PDF. And they have all the hidden slides with all the screenshots and everything that we couldn't cover. And yeah, do you mind if I, sorry, can I just get a photo of everybody? Just for, my, for my kids. I, I had 30 people, and I had 100 or 90 people on the, uh, on the wait list. So I was curious about how many would show up. Um, yeah, so thanks very much. Um, this is only the second lightning talk that we've ever had, I think. So we'd appreciate feedback and, and things like that. Yeah, awesome. Thank you.